Hello everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another falconry video. Today's video I'm going to be talking about molting your bird and what to do during the molt. It's a very important topic actually if you're going to be a falconer long term. Unless you're getting a new bird every year and then passing it on or releasing it into the wild, you got to know what you're doing. This is vital. This video will help make sure your face doesn't get grabbed. It'll make sure you don't lose the bird and your bird doesn't break feathers. These seem very important. Uh, if you haven't already, if you could hit subscribe, it very much helps me keep this channel up and going. And with that, what is molting? Molting is losing feathers and growing in a new set. Despite what cartoons and movies show, this is not random. It's not like, oh, birds are flying and feathers are going everywhere. No. The number of birds a feather has is an even number. They have kind of a matched pair. And typically, with raptors, during the summer, they're going to lose these two. They start growing in. Then these two. Then they start growing in. Then these two. They start growing in. It's a process. It's a process that happens faster in the care of humanity. If you are keeping a bird, typically, they will go through the molt. So in other words, if a molt takes this many months in the wild, it takes this many in captivity. We give a richer, more regular, more confirmed diet that doesn't require caloric consumption to obtain. And so their body's like, hey, this is great. Normally, raptors lose their feathers in the summer and grow this new set every year. This is very useful as a survival strategy because if you have any broken feathers in the wild, they can't repair them, so you get a new set. Why the summer? Um, there's more food available. A lot of it, first of all, it's warm, so you yourself are not burning through calories as quickly just to stay warm. So you can utilize more of those calories, whatever you have, towards the growing of new feathers. But also, animals are having babies. There's, uh, the food chain explodes in the warmer months, and there's food available. That's also why most animals have their babies. Whether you're a herbivore, an omnivore, or a carnivore, most animals have their young during the warmer months for the same reason. Because calorically, the, 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 the landscape is chock full of energy, available in the form of calories from plants and insects to baby animals, it's, it's great. Okay, so, but you got a bird, you've got a falconry bird, or an education bird, or a zoo bird, whatever, whoever you are watching this show. So what do you do? Well, first of all, most of us do not fly our birds throughout the molt. There's a lot of reasons why. Uh, part of it is uh, migration instincts can kick in for some of them. Uh, part of it is in the hot months, uh, they're not as motivated to fly. They're like, I'm just hot and miserable. I just kind of want to sit around. And perhaps most importantly, falconry is a hunting sport. And most species of quarry that you're legally hunting, they have seasons. And those seasons are set up to make sure that your quarry in the spring and summer can have their young, raise their young before the hunting season starts. So you don't want to be out hunting a parent bird, uh, you know, a, a parent quarry item, or or damaging what's supposed to be the rising generation. The hunting laws are set up that way. Some people do. There's some people who do on and hunt their birds through the molt, and there's that video is not about that. I can do another video about reverse molting or flying through a molt, but that's not what this is. Let's say you've got a normal situation. You, you caught a red-tailed hawk, and you're going to molt it, or you, you, you bought a captive bred peregrine falcon, and there you're going to molt it. So you don't want to fly it. Feathers are delicate when they're growing in. They have blood coursing through the shaft as they're growing in. And any damage to that can damage the feather permanently. It can also be harmful and even lethal to a bird. So you don't want them risking damaging that. And you could say, well, what about in the wild? Birds do in the wild. Yeah, I know. But you know better. You, you can give them food without them risking damaging their feathers. Typically, we use a rich, varied diet. That's me. Now remember, I, I love making these videos. But remember, I'm just Ben Woodruff. I'm a falconer with a broad range of deep experience, but that doesn't mean what I say is right. There is no right in falconry. There's a lot of different ways that work, and I share ways that work for me, have worked very successfully, and sometimes they share other ways as well. But remember, just because my way, just because I say it, is not me, me declaring, this is how it is to be done. I'm just sharing what works and hoping it'll help you out. And if you have a different way that works, great. So for me personally, and I, I have falconer friends who fly and molt successfully do the exact opposite of me. But here's my thinking. In the, in the flying season, fall and the winter and early spring, my bird's an Olympic athlete. I'm going to cut the fat. I'm going to build the muscle. And I want my my weight management to be to the gram to the hour. It's like at 3 o'clock p.m. you're going to weigh exactly this amount. Uh, I even often have my birds inside to make sure temperature fluctuations outside don't impact my weight management. Now with that, 
I usually pick a food source and stick with it. Usually, it is just quail, captive bred Japanese quail, and Vitahawk uh, vitamin supplement, and that's it. Because then I know consistently how they're gonna digest it. That's usually what I do during the hunting season. Once I hit uh, the, the molt, and I'm not flying my bird, I want my bird fat and happy. I lead him, let him eat everything. Here, you're eating some sparrows, you're eating quail, you're eating beef heart, you're eating cockerels, you're eating uh, Vitahawk, but also there are vitamin supplements specifically for the molt. Uh, here, here's a mix of everything. Let me give you just a, a, just a smorgasbord of biological compounds from different food sources that you can utilize to regrow the bones and strengthen your bones and your medullary bone tissue that you can use to regrow feathers and to do it quickly. Uh, that's my thinking. I know people who do the opposite. I know people who say, oh, I do a very varied diet during the hunting season and just kind of stick them with something simple during the molt. I don't understand that, but they fly their birds and it works well. I told you the logic behind mine. I want consistency with weight management in the hunting season and I want excess of nutrients and caloric opportunities and chemical compounds available to their body for regrowing things during the molt. And so that's why I feed them a bit of everything. Water is crucial all the time for a bird, but especially vital that you have clean, fresh water for that bird to be able to molt. They need it. That is part of the compound, the chemical compounds you are making to grow new feathers. Now, what do you do with this bird though? How have you been keeping your bird? There's not a right or wrong way of what to do. There's a lot of options. You could free loft your bird, which is means they're in their mew and they're untethered and they're just allowed to do their own thing. Uh, you could have them tethered in a mew or a weathering area. But along those lines too, are you handling them? Are you socializing them? You, everybody knows me. I, I always promote socialize your bird, handle your bird, acclimate your bird all the time. The more you do, the better, right? Eh? Yes, but that can be a big problem. Let me give you an example. Deer falcons, which are crazy. I love flying deer falcons, but deer falcons are nuts. And in the summer, that's very stressful for them because once they're fat, they're just kind of like, hey, flipping out everything. You go out to handle them and work with them and it's summer temperatures and they start baiting and jumping and flapping. Their heart rate goes up. They're built for the frigid Arctic. They've got these insulated feathers. You've just raised their heart rate and their temperature. You could cause damages. Just that alone could cause their immune system to drop and make them susceptible more to diseases like aspergillosis. So there are some birds that my opinion is, whether it's by species like deer falcons, I don't, I don't work with them in the summer. Deer falcons in the summer, I'm like, okay, you're free lo you're, you might be tethered or free lofted depending on the individual, but you're in your mew, I feed you, I give you water, and I bring ice blocks in that you can sit on as well to help cool off, and I do not mess with you. I just let you chill. Um, but it depends on the individual bird as well, but some species across the board, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna free, I'm just gonna just not handle my deer falcons during the summer. But there's big problems that happen with aggression and territorial that, that can develop that you don't realize is happening. So let's say, for example, you've got your bird in your mew. And throughout the season, this first new bird you got, you take out, you go hunting with it, you come home, you put it in the mew. Maybe you feed it in the mew sometimes, but then now it's the molt. And well, I'm not flying the bird and you just every day start bringing food in there. Suddenly, the relation of food to that geographic space has turned it into territory. Territory is something to be defensive and aggressive of. And next thing you know, by towards the end of the molt, every time you walk into the mew, your bird's trying to attack you and you don't know why. Or it's anticipating you bringing food and it's lunging at you for that food. That's not good. Now, some birds, this isn't a problem at all, but some birds, it's a huge problem that you have to contend with. So that might be better to say, hey, I'm going to take my bird out and I'm going to clip it to a, a leash, a long leash, and I have food somewhere else that I already put there so the bird doesn't visually see me putting that food out. And I just come around the corner of the house, oh, there's food there. It leaves your fist, goes there, lands on the food, eats it, you go stand by it, and then it eats it, then you pick it up, hang out with it for a few minutes, put it back in the mew with no food, okay? That's a very good way to do it. It's a pain in the butt because if your bird's fat, it might not wanna eat. If your bird's fat, it might just be like, oh, it's hot. I'm fat, I'm not that hungry, and I might just sit on the food. 
But you have to plan that out. You have to ration your, your portions and make sure that a bird can do it. That is a very good way to keep your bird from developing closeted aggressiveness and territoriality. Territoriality? How would you say it? I don't know. Uh, during the summer, during the molt. That, that's really important. It's, it's vital because that can sneak up on you. Now, also, your bird that was so tame and so loyal and so easy to work with, you might find that I've known a few people where they're mew, they don't have a double door, and they come out to feed their bird, and it's used to them bringing food to the mew during the summer, so it's used to flying towards you like it's hunting. And you open the door, it hears you coming, you open up the door, whoop, bird flies out. And you've lost your bird and you're not going to get it back because it's fat, it's summertime, the bird just wants to go leave. That's not good, you just lost your bird. So that's, uh, again, first of all, a good reason why you should have a double door to your mew. But aside from that, if you are feeding in your mew, that's what's going to happen. That could, well, that could very well happen and it often does to people who don't know any better. So we don't want our birds to be aggressive, we don't want them to be territorial. Um, well, again, let me rephrase that. I say this all the time, aggression is good. You can't get rid of it. You have to direct it properly and it should be directed at quarry. It should not be directed at your face. It should not be directed at a mew. It should not be directed at the sound of you walking towards a mew. And so you've got to turn that around during that molt. Uh, as far as free lofting versus tethering your bird during the molt, most birds are pretty chill during the summer. They try not to move much because it's hot. And if you're moving a lot, it generates heat, which traps in the feathers and they want to stay cool. Most birds, again, are pretty chill because they're fat and happy. They're not like, we got to go hunting because they are fat. So they're just like, hey man, what's going on? Yeah, oh, I'm pretty full. I don't know, nope, nope, don't want to chase anything. That's most birds. Not all of them are that way. Usually across the board, owls, eagles, falcons, sippeters, bootios, all of them, harris hawks, I free loft them, almost all of them during the summer. Usually the only reason I don't is if a bird is kind of a psycho that bounces off the walls and might break a feather. If, I, if for some reason you have an individual that has that kind of energy and it might break, bend, or damage a growing feather shaft that still has blood in it, it's not worth the risk. Um, but the plus of it is having your bird free lofted in a mew, they're getting a little bit of good exercise. There's, and they're not going to be totally fit, but that's good for them. It's good for their mind. It's good for their body to have them moving and get some exercise. But hold on a second. Your bird's fat. The risk of pressure sores goes way up during the molt. They have way more weight. They're sitting, they're sedentary. You're not out flying them because they're fat. So they could get pressure sores, which can also lead to bumblefoot which can end up ultimately killing a bird. It's not good. So you need to make sure anywhere your bird is perching during the molt, I mean, this is true all year round, but especially during the molt, whether it's on a tethered perch or whether you've got perches around, make sure you have good clean perches that have support. Uh, most of us like to use AstroTurf, the big, like the doormat AstroTurf, that with the big, long, little fake blades of grass that are very thick, you gotta make sure to take it off and clean it in case they're getting anything on it. But that is a good perch surface because it helps spread out the weight of the overweight bird so that they're not getting pressure sores. So you, if you have some nice good branches like you'd have in the wild, if they, then they have, they're going to pick their preferred spot. They're always going to sit right on this spot of this one branch. And then that means some pad is getting all this pressure day and night. That's not good. You need the variety. Or you need to disperse the heat. It's kind of like a snowshoe in reverse. Uh, is kind of what you're doing. Uh, the AstroTurf Stadium, it's kind of like, you know, a foot will sink in the snow, but when you spread it out, it doesn't sink. It's a similar thing, but in reverse. You have a pad that they're standing on that spreads out their heat, so uh, their weight, so they're not putting as much pressure on it. So wherever, whatever you use, make sure that your perch surfaces, this is vital, can spread out the weight of your bird and change them around. You know, if you have the AstroTurf on this way, maybe change the angle another day, take them off, clean them, or clean them on there, make sure that they don't have bacteria on them, and that will help your bird's feet get through it. Um, and as far as just the socialization, you've got to know your bird. 
if your bird is benefiting from it. I see a lot of falcons just kind of go nuts. There's a lot of falcons that during the mold, they just bleh. It's like, just let them be wild. Just let them fatten up and, and free loft. But hawks, you know, but whether it's a, a budio or an occipiter, eagles, owls, I still socialize them. I still take them out. I'll even do educational shows during the summer with them. But I usually don't with falcons that are molting. But know your bird. Know your species and talk to other falconers who know that species as well, and you'll do well. Just do it right and get through it, and then once you get to uh, the beginning, end of summer, beginning of fall, start cutting that bird's weight and just kind of retrain them, and their brain will, oh yeah, snap back in, and you're back in business. So hope this is useful to you. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you haven't already, please hit subscribe, and as always, happy hawking.